Joining me now is Cameron Kasky. He is, of course, one of the Parkland Survivors, co-founder of the March for Our Lives. And that is an amazing group that has had some great successes and brought a lot of public attention to an issue that needs that attention. Just at the end of the Young Turks today, the last story we did was another shooting. Unfortunately, there's been a mass shooting pretty much every day this year as there was last year. So I wanna to talk to you, Cameron, about that. And I wanna to talk to you about your new podcast and your thoughts on the midterms. So let's get started with how you started March for Our Lives in the first place. Obviously, there's a tragedy and then, but there's tragedies all the time. And, and you know, movements don't necessarily arise from them. How did this one arise? Well, you know, I was born in 2000, which means that I, I, I've really kind of grown up seeing all these school shootings. I mean, this recent boom of mass school shootings that we've seen, that, that's kind of what my generation really grew up on. And it's something we've become so accustomed to. So when, you know, when, when uh, Gen Xers or millennials were expressing more shock, we, I didn't understand it because you know I remember where I was when I found out about Aurora and Sandy Hook, and I remember not really being able to fully understand it because when Aurora happened, I was about eleven. I was about eleven years old. Same for Sandy Hook. Give it was that time frame, and I remember thinking, you know, after everything that's happened, do I want people to look back at Stoneman Douglas, the school that I love so much, and remember footage of people crying and you know panning shots of a of a small town, or do I want people to remember? Everybody standing up and saying no more, because you know after these shootings, rightfully so, many communities simply focus on healing and coming together, and I think that's incredibly important. And I think Parkland did an amazing job of that. But I also wanted people to look at us and say, these are the people who said, when when will there be enough? Yeah, I, I love that you guys fought back in the ways that you could in the political and uh, and through your speech and through protests, etc. Uh, and you're absolutely right, Cameron, and I hadn't thought of it that way. Uh, I'm not a millennial, so when I was growing up, um, there weren't nonstop shootings. Uh, I remember the turning point, at least in, in a lot of the uh, mindsets of, of, most, of a lot of Americans my age, was Columbine. Uh, and, and that was a thing that we were like, whoa, we can't believe. Columbine was supposed to be an anomaly. And that was right. that was a big good conversation that we had. I understood why people didn't take action after Columbine. I do because in retrospect, who should have thought that that was ever going to happen again? Columbine was supposed to be this unbelievably horrible thing that was really just an anomaly. But then it happens again and again and again, and we get to a point where we say, "Well, how often are we supposed to shrug this off as the price of our freedom?" And sometimes people will say that I get angry on the show. Yeah, I do, uh, and. Uh, on an issue like this, I think that that's the proper reaction. What, what am I supposed to be calm about you know, kids being massacred in our schools on a daily basis? We were too calm after Sandy Hook. And, and what happened after Sandy Hook? Unfortunately, now the parents are being chased all around the country by insane conspiracy theorists. Well, the action went in the wrong direction. It, it shows you that, that after such a horrible tragedy, you see the best and you see the worst of humanity. Uh, after 9-11, you saw so many heroic stories of people saving each other and not caring who, they, who the other person was. Uh, just the, the other day, I was with uh, somebody who survived the 9-11 attacks at the Pentagon, and he said, you know, when people were running into the fire and pulling people out, they didn't care who you were or where you came from. We were all humans. And, you know, after shootings like Sandy Hook or Stoneman Douglas, you see kindness and you see such amazing people stepping forward. But then you'll see some people who are commenting horrible things about children on the internet, and their profile pictures are cartoon frogs. You know, yeah. And um, it, it gives you a lot of perspective—perspective perspective that I wish I never had to gain, but I'm glad I did. Right, and and they came for after you guys too, and you know, the insane theories about how you guys were crisis actors. Well, I, you know, that one that one is is quite ridiculous. But I have to give them credit. I was inc deeply invested in Stoneman Douglas's drama program, <laughs> and Stoneman Douglas was in crisis. So calling me a crisis actor was in many ways correct, in many ways false. So you know, if if somebody saw our production of Fiddler on the Roof and then saw me going out there speaking, I understand what they mean. So uh, you know, I. Of course, I know you're kidding, and uh, and 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 I hope that you've got a great career uh, in in theater. Maybe one day, you know, I don't know if that's what you want to do, but I I guarantee you that some people will actually take that clip. 
<laughs> oh no, yeah, no. I, in this situation, people people like you and I and many others in our in in the field that we have been that we've stepped into, we live for things we say to be taken out of context. I mean, it happened just yesterday. I did an interview where I discussed the fact that I left March for Our Lives to pursue different things because I had put in six months of time and effort. And, you know, after a shooting, when you when you jump right into the fire, it's very easy to get burnt out. So I, I talked about how I left and how I was focusing on messages of bipartisanship. And many people turned that into a headline, Caskey dumps March for Our Lives hates the gun control movement. I mean, no, it's, it's, it's taken out of context. I'm actually super proud of my friends, and I think that they're, they're doing a better job without me, but that's, that's editorialization. But, you know, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure many things you've said have just been ripped in. Oh, nonstop, nonstop. They will literally take half a sentence, and with no shame at all, just uh, take it as if I said the opposite of what I said. Uh, anyway, uh, so, but you guys, uh, Got things accomplished. You got Florida to pass a law, which is amazing. Uh, you know, I I would have wanted the law to be uh, stronger, but it's a lot better than what it used to be. So, what's in the law? Do you like it? Don't like it? That got passed after the shooting. So, I was very openly critical of the law, and I was also very openly critical of the Stop School Violence Act that was passed in the omnibus. And I was trying to figure out what what was my biggest problem with them because there's actually nothing I I dislike there. And I realized what it was. My biggest fear is that passing small laws that are good steps to safety for the students are going to let you know lawmakers who don't want to take real action here hide behind them. So with the Stop School Violence Act, which was very, which was filled with a lot of language that I didn't really expect to see much come out of, I was very, very critical simply because I said, okay, then anybody who voted for that is gonna be able to say, look, I helped the kids, when I didn't think that was enough of a step. But I, um, I really liked the law that was passed in Florida. I'm very openly critical of Rick Scott. I think he's a big fraud, but I also think that his ability to go out there and pass that was very impressive, especially since Florida, of course, got sued by the NRA afterwards. Um, because, you know, if you pass that kind of law, you're gonna get sued by the NRA. Are you familiar with Marion Hammer? Uh, only in passing. She is a, she's an, an NRA enforcer in the state of Florida. And if you, I encourage you to Google it for her. She is, she is a, a, an interesting character, and, and we would see her in the Florida State Legislature just walk by everybody, go right into an office, walk out with somebody looking terrified. And, and they look terrified because here's somebody from the gun lobby who says, in this case, we're gonna take you out with money. Uh, we're gonna spend uh, enough money to make sure that you lose. They spent $50 million in the last election. Well, I, think that, I think that the NRA's reach is, is well, well, a lot of it's monetary. There's, there's more things we need to focus on. You'll see that the NRA's greatest strength, in my opinion, is their ability to mobilize smaller groups of people for smaller elections. So the NRA would be able to send a text that says, you know, to, to a group, to an election with maybe 5,000 people in some state, some random state, you know, the, this this mayor is going to take away your gun rights. Go vote. And the NRA members, however many there are, I. I, I don't think there's actually five million. And I mean, my, my friend David signed up for like four different memberships. So I don't think they really have five million people, but mm -hmm. they're able to get people moving. And it's it's actually remarkable. The, the way they structure that is is very, very effective. They really know how to mobilize people using fear. Uh, I just figured out how they're gonna twist what you just said. Uh, Parkland Survivor says he's friendly with the NRA. Parkland Survivor <laughs> says NRA, NRA handles their work fantastically, yes. Right, <laughs> so. Look, um, um, I, you know, yeah. I think I, I've, dis I've developed a different understanding for gun owners in this country. At first I thought that anybody who disagreed with me about guns didn't care when kids died. Look, I think 96% 96, 96 of people in this country really care when, when, when a school mm -hmm. shooting happens. 4%, whatever, but I think a lot of people care and I, I think that I spent so much time thinking that I was right, and, and I, I, you know, I still firmly stand on my beliefs with gun control, but I used to think that if you didn't share them, you were, you were malicious. And then I met that guy in Texas who has an AR-15 in the house to protect his family because he doesn't, he doesn't understand other perspectives. I met that family that really just carries their firearms to defend themselves, and while I don't agree with all these gun laws, I, I now get where these people are coming from, and that was Yeah, it. well, you know, Cameron, you're actually more understanding than I am, uh, because, look, I got a hobby too, it's fantasy football, but nobody dies because of it, so. Well, uh, very few people die because of it. I'm yes. sure there have been some rough cases with. <laughs> yes, but uh, but their, their hobby, uh, unfortunately, has led to uh, Americans owning 48% of all the guns in the world and, and more mass shootings here uh, than, than any other country by 
uh, an order of magnitude. But I, I said uh, we were gonna talk about the midterm elections and you were just talking about how the NRA affects elections. So what, what's your take on the midterms? So I think the midterms this year are, are, are going to be huge. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that you know the 2014 midterm should have served as a big wake up call. They had the lowest voter turnout since what was it World War II, and right now people have a lot to vote for this year. I thought it was going to be a single issue election. I thought you know, but back when I was beginning this activism, I thought people were going to be voting on guns, and that was it. But after summer, I you know all these things are coming out with the different stories, immigration, Kavanaugh, all these things, and I think this midterms, the, the, this is going to be a big message about the future of our country. Yeah, you know, all, all my life, people always say this upcoming election is the most important election of our lives, and my job is to give real analysis. And some of the time I go, no, not really. No, Clinton versus Dole was not the most important election of your life. No, really? Right? Whoa, Bob nor, Dole. Nor, nor was Obama versus Romney, if you ask me. Okay. Uh, but these midterms, this one's for real. This is, especially among midterms, probably the single most important midterm of my life. So, so I, I, I think I mean, you're absolutely right. It's about a that. big one. I mean, I remember, if, for example, you know, during the Obama Romney election, I was talking to my parents. My parents were pretty much saying, like, I'm cool either way. That was an election where I know a lot of people in this country were saying, I understand where both of them are coming from, and I think both of them are civil servants, whether or not I agree with them. But this this is a midterms that I that are it's going to be, I mean, I, I, I'm hoping that this is the highest voter turnout in the history of the United States. I don't know if it's going to be like that. I'm, I'm praying it will be, but yeah. again, it's a message to saying, well, what's 2020 going to look like? What are these next coming years going to look like? All right. So Cameron, one last thing: uh, you start a podcast. Yes. Uh, it, it, the title is Cameron Knows Nothing. So what's it about? <laughs> So um, you know, so a lot of punditry right now comes from people saying, "Hey, listen to me. I'm the expert. Come hear what I've got to say." And I, I actually appreciate a lot of that punditry, and I enjoy it. But I think that one thing we're not seeing a lot of is people who are admittedly saying, "You know, I don't know very much about these things. Come learn with me." Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I was very often propped up as an expert on things like gun control and and other topics when I'm not the expert on very much at all. Uh, so uh, you know, I'm going to be speaking to a lot of different people. Hopefully, you. Uh, ho this is this is me get, getting you to do the show. Everybody <laughs> watching this, you have to hold them to it. Um, okay. I want to just you know, I want I want people to avoid the mistakes I made, where they jumped right into something without learning too much about it first. And I want them to reassess things because when you're a 17 year old boy, you think you know everything. Turns out, you know, I think it's really important for everybody, no matter where you fall on the on whatever side of the aisle, to read every side to read every perspective. You know, if there's a new topic, I'll read everything from Young Turks, CNN, Fox News, Daily Wire. I like I like to compile everything, which is why I'm still a, an avid reader. All right, Cameron Kasky, um, fighting back and uh, and trying to get a little bit of justice in this country. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks appreciate a lot, my it, friend. Much appreciated. Like what you see? I hope so. Thank you. So click the subscribe button below and don't forget to ring the bell to never miss another video from Rebel HQ.